All right, everybody, we're jumping into an ad. And like usual, it's at the beginning of our episode. So don't skip this. You're going to want to watch this because we have some very important information. Peyton and I are going to be talking about SeatGeek. So actually last year, I don't know how many of you know this. It was on Peyton's personal socials kind of everywhere. But I surprised her with a trip to Nashville and took her to an Olivia Rodrigo concert. Yep, it was so fun. We showed up at the airport and I was like, wait, why are we going to Nashville instead of where we were originally going? And he said, surprise. And I actually bought those tickets through SeatGeek. They made it super easy. And today's video is sponsored by SeatGeek. With over 28 million downloads, SeatGeek is the number one rated ticketing app. There are more than 70,000 events every single day on SeatGeek, including concerts, sports, festivals, and more. And if you want to surprise your loved one with tickets to Olivia Rodrigo, this is the perfect place. Each ticket is rated on a scale of 1 to 10, so look for the green dots. Green means good, red means bad. Every ticket is backed by their buyer guarantee, and SeatGeek is the only site that lets you return your tickets ahead of the event with swaps. And you know that we came through for you guys. Use our code HUSBAND for $20 off tickets at SeatGeek. That's $20 off your first purchase with promo code HUSBAND. Make sure you click the link in the description to download the app. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to our podcast. This is Murder With My Husband. I'm Peyton Moreland. And I'm Garrett Moreland. And he's the husband. And I'm the husband. If you are watching on YouTube, our set definitely looks different right now. And if you are listening on audio, we might even sound a little bit different. And that is because we are doing something today that we have never done on this show. We have been trying to do this for a while now. And we have two special people here, Kendall and Josh. They are from Mile Higher Podcast, Mile Higher Media. If you don't know who Kendall and Josh are, let's hear about it. Howdy, people. What's up? (laughs) We are so excited to be here today. We've been planning this collaboration with Garrett and Peyton for quite some time after many failed attempts for various (laughs) reasons. They literally came all the way out to Colorado over the summer, and we talked about it more on our episode, exactly what happened. Yeah. didn't Life work happens, out. yeah. And then they tried to come again recently. That didn't work out. So here we are, third time's a charm. And we are so excited to be on your show. We are so excited to have you guys. Like our listeners have been commenting because I think we teased it last time and then it didn't even happen. And they were so pumped for it. So I'm seriously <laughs> so excited that it's actually happening. Granted, this isn't edited and up yet, but I know everything yes. is going to run smoothly. Yeah, it has we're to. Like, until it's on the internet, we don't believe it's going <laughs> to yeah. actually make it to the finish line. But. And it's so perfect because it's another husband and wife duo as well. Yeah. yeah. It's just perfect for us. Yeah. Exactly. It really is so perfect. Why yeah. don't you guys tell a little bit about yourself for those who maybe don't know of you? Yeah. Yeah. So um, starting with myself, I have been on the interwebs for a very long time. Uh, I have a YouTube channel called True Crime with Kendall Ray. I've been doing that channel for going on 11 years, so I am old. She's an icon (laughs) in the true crime community. Let's be real. It's amazing. If you you have not checked it out, go and check it out. Oh, I appreciate that. Um, Yes, so much fun. Um, I started with that, really got fascinated by true crime, and eventually started another podcast called Mile Higher Podcast with my husband here, Josh. What's up? What's up? <laughs> and we've been doing that since 2017, 2018, 2018. Yeah, I think we started at the beginning of 2018 was our first mm-hmm. episode. And we've been doing it ever since. Yep. So we cover a wide variety of topics, everything from mysteries, um, true crime, paranormal, a little bit of conspiracy, just kind of a little bit of everything. And um, anything that makes you think. That's right. That's, we like to that's our think motto outside the box about, take about your mind a cases mile and theories yeah. out there and ponder the, the deepest questions of the universe occasionally. <laughs> so <laughs> things, things get quite deep over here. Yes, um, for sure. Sometimes we can't quite find our way out of the rabbit hole, but yeah, we hard. have a good time. So <laughs> We do. We that do. that kind of actually are, uh, happened. We just recorded our episode for Mile Higher, and we kind of got stuck in a rabbit hole. We and did. Found, could not find our way out, even by the end. Yeah, we literally had to have a vote at the end of what we all thought happened. Yeah, so that was. It was kind of like all fun. you guys were like leaning one way at the beginning, and then by the end of it, we're all just kind of like it was crazy. Mm. Our minds are blown. Yeah. We're like, yeah. well, wait, I'm still could stuck on this? it. Yeah, it's it like one of those. Case. I went home and continued to think yeah, about. Yeah. Yep. You know? On today's episode of Mile Higher, we have two guests joining us, Peyton 
and Garrett from Murder With My Husband. Hi, everyone. Mysterious murder case in Aspen, the first murder there in 12 years. Why is Nancy S. already speculating that Nancy killed herself? I need you to tell me exactly what happened. My friend is in her closet, dead. She disrespected me like no other person has ever done. Oh, that was the wrong reaction. He must be guilty. You get bad landlords all the time. You don't go off and kill them. When he saw Nancy just peacefully sleeping there, something just flipped in him. My mom could never hurt anything or hurt anyone. Like, I just think there is no way he could have done that alone. He also wrote, be careful what you ask for. You may get more than you expect. We just recorded our episode for Mile Higher that you can actually check out on Wednesday when it drops. You guys will need to go check that out. And Josh, you actually have another podcast as well. Oh, I do. Yes. Yeah, so if you're into the darker uh, side of true crime, I cover a lot of very, very disturbing cases, uh, cults. I get into a lot of hauntings, demonic possession. Uh, I kind of have a dark side to me, I guess. And so, <laughs> you know, mile higher, I wasn't able to go quite as deep into the darkness as I wanted to. So, so I get scared. You get a little, <laughs> get a little scared. So I was like, you know what? I got to start a show mm -hmm. and the show is called lights out. Yep. Um, it's on YouTube, Spotify, everywhere that you get a podcast. And it's, it's kind of a different show because it's a little, it's, it's definitely got some conversation there, but I kind of create like an immersive experience. Mm -hmm. So there's sound mm -hmm. effects and a little bit of music in there. And it kind of really, you know, let's just say people leave the episode with chills most of the time. Yeah. So it's one of those types of shows. So if you want to check that out, I'd love for you to join us it at lights out every Friday. It's amazing. Again, we are so happy to have them on. And we're also really excited for all of you listeners to get to know them through our episode. So I think it's going to be great. And today we are doing something totally different for us. Um, we always come mm -hmm. into our episodes very prepared. Oh, and uh -huh. yes. you know, we really know the case front and back. But today we wanted to, you know, have a new experience where you guys kind of we get to be Garrett. Yeah. 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 Them, I mean, everyone knows a little bit Garrett. more than Garrett. Yeah. <laughs> I'm so excited to be Garrett. No. <laughs> I got the easy job over here. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, definitely. But um, I think it'll be an interesting experience to yeah. get to. It's almost like I'm going to be listening to a podcast and getting to interact with it in real time, which is yes. so cool. Um, we know a little bit about the case. Yeah. Just kind of. Yeah. Like you know, a few overview. sentences on Wikipedia. Almost. Like, yeah. yeah. Maybe a little more than that, but we yeah. definitely aren't experts yeah. on this case by any means yeah. so we're hearing it for the first time as well mm -hmm. along with garrett and i think it'll all be fun for you guys um to have more voices on the podcast yeah. i think you guys are going to love it we've never done this before the only ever guest we've had is peyton's mom mm -hmm. um so this will be super fun for us yeah she's awesome yeah she's love amazing her. yeah her new show rising crime is out i know we got a bunch of love on it so shout out to you guys and go check it out if you haven't but uh, it's definitely fun. I got to be a Garrett yesterday listening to Kendall and Josh. And as a true crime host, you will see today, it is super fun to be a listener and kind of come up with your own ideas that aren't as scripted to be Garrett. Really, Garrett's yeah. just the lucky one out of all of us. Everyone here. just wants the to best be Garrett. Over here, <laughs> I want to be Garrett. That's sweet. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, before we get into it, Kendall and Josh, we actually do this thing on our podcast where Garrett gets his little 10 seconds Woo! because I always do research and <laughs> prepare. So Garrett gets his little corner. So here we go. We're jumping into Garrett's 10, 10 seconds. Nine. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Seriously. He's got 10 seconds. I was going to say, it's usually a little longer than 10 seconds. <laughs> yeah. That's awesome. It did start as 10 seconds and now it's a couple minutes, I feel yeah. like, every oh, single cool. time. I'm here for it. But I have it planned. I have it ready. Um, it happened yesterday, actually. After we left. After we left, we went and got Dutch Brothers, Dutch Bros. Is it Dutch? It's not Dutch, Dutch Brothers. Brothers huh? <laughs> <laughs> I love that. I'm going to start. You guys better sponsor us now after that. Yeah. Dutch Brothers. Dutch, Dutch Brothers. Brothers. <laughs> um, so we went and got Dutch Bros. We had our Uber take us through. Everything was going fine. We got the drinks. <laughs> We were driving. Everything was good. You know, we were sipping our Dutch bros. Peyton was happy because she really wanted it. Um, I decided to put it in between my lap for a second and got on my phone. Oh, no. And the Uber driver decided to drive like he was driving in an F1 race. <laughs> and he took off and it just went boom oh, and spilled no. all over me, Everywhere. all over the seat. 
and I I was freaking out. I didn't know what to do. Oh, Peyton's just so looking the Uber driver at me. Didn't notice. Didn't notice. It was all over the seat. I'm just like <laughs> rubbing just... my button, trying to soak up all the coffee. <laughs> it was oh my gosh. I was it was horrible. We just sat there staring at each other for a solid ten seconds. Deer in oh, the headlights, man. like. What do we do from here? Where does this go? And I do want to say the seat wasn't sticky no. or anything. Don't worry. We didn't leave it. Was it, it leather seats or cloth? It was leather it was seats. Leather. Okay. <laughs> Easy to clean. Um, yeah. But poor Garrett then had to walk in the hotel. His pants looked like he'd peed yeah. everywhere. No. <laughs> yeah. So and you didn't a, get to enjoy your Dutch and Bros. And I didn't get in the, enjoy my Dutch Bros. So oh, what a bummer. She's happy as she, can oh, be. She oh, could not, yeah. I was just <laughs> sipping my coffee, laughing so hard. She was. She had both in her hand just looking at me, just cracking up. It like, was, that did not just happen. It was great. So, it was so good. that's my 10 seconds. I thought it was a pretty good one. Was it iced or hot? It was iced, at least. Uh, which I yeah. guess is better than that's hot. That's the one good takeaway. From yeah. This. yeah. Burn yourself. If it was hot. That Burn was, your crotch, man. Yes. Like, that was, <laughs> yes, that was, it was everywhere and you could have everywhere. had a dutch bros lawsuit yeah exactly yeah. i know i know now you really have to sponsor us yeah, yeah. that's right <laughs> that's so funny that's my 10 seconds this week and on that note <laughs> love that let's <laughs> pop into today's episode all right well our case sources today are the sydney morning herald the weekend australian coroners.nsw.gov the Special Broadcasting Service, The Daily Mail, ABC News, 60 Minutes Australia, Yahoo News, The Daily Telegraph, This Old House, Google Maps, and The New Zealand Herald. Okay, so like we said, Garrett and I joined Josh and Kendall on their podcast, Mile Higher, to discuss a completely different case than what we are talking about today. And that case involved Nancy Pfister and the question of whether she was killed by one two or three people altogether. But Nancy was a bit of a socialite who was the life of the party and really loved to party. And interestingly enough, today we are discussing the disappearance of Matthew Levison, who himself was an outgoing life of the party type who happened to disappear during a night of partying. Interesting. So let's get into it. Our episode this week begins with the birth of a little boy, Matthew John Levison, who was born on December 12th, 1986 to Faye and Mark Levison over in Australia. Matthew, who sometimes goes by Matt, was born into a very tight-knit family, and he has two brothers, Peter and Jason. Speaking of Australia, we were just talking about that yesterday. Yeah, we that were. That we need to go there because Kendall and Josh have been there. Yeah. yeah. Um, they said it was amazing. Yeah, we One went to our favorite our... spot was Sydney, I'd say. Uh, is this a taking place in Sydney? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Oh, yeah. Sydney is so cool. Yeah. We only got three days there and we wish we stayed longer. It was <sighs> so awesome. We That's need so to cool. go. We do. Just the people. They're, Australians Aussies are, so are just cool. the coolest. Yeah. yeah. Like, they are. Very laid back and friendly. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Like we, we, and then we did another trip to London and kind of a sorry, you UK folks. A little bit, a Don't little bit different. Uh, <laughs> no, just I think there's just more different vibe. I felt more judgment walking around. Yeah, they're like, ew, Americans. <laughs> Maybe yeah. that's so Versus funny. Australians are like Americans. Yeah, like yeah, what's up, mate? So <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's so funny. Did they all say bloke there. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. That? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was saying bloke for like three months. That's oh, hilarious. that's so great. Yeah. <laughs> so there are three boys total in the Levison family, and Matt grows up and into a teen, and he becomes interested in travel and music. He is also known for being social and close with many friends and with his family. He's just, he's kind, he's outgoing, he's just a light in everyone's life. By the time he becomes an adult and begins exploring his individual life, one source says that Matt is working as a wildlife welfare officer and other sources say he's working at an insurance company. But either way, something critical to our case today is that Matthew is openly gay and is accepted and loved by his family. And the older he gets, the more his character deepens. He's got a fun personality. He's a joking prankster type of person, just very full of life. And on top of all of this, Matthew is very photogenic. He has bleached blonde hair. He's got big blue eyes, a very big smile. He's fit with an athletic build. And as I mentioned at the start of our case, we are in Australia following Matt's life. And Sydney is the most populous city in Australia with a current population of over 5 million. But in 2007, 
when our case takes place, the population of Sydney is approximately 4 million people. I feel like everyone in Australia is like built, beach blonde tan. hair, surfs, tan, you know, mm -hmm. I don't know. What's Opposite that? of Americans. Yes. Yeah. Show H2O Mermaids. Yes. That's in Australia. Yeah. Everyone looks that. like Matt. It's like a old I think cheesy it's a kids, film. Or a kids, kids TV Australian show. show. Oh, yeah, yeah. Interesting. About these three girls who become mermaids. Holly oh, might I like love it. That. Yeah. 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 <laughs> My daughter. Yeah. So we are also in Darlinghurst, which is an area in the inner city of Sydney. Um, and that's where we'll be located today. And Darlinghurst is known for being the hub of the LGBTQ community in mm. Sydney. Okay. And it boasts many restaurants, nightclubs, and bars. So as a lively and outgoing 20-year-old, Matt Levison regularly goes to these bars. And he often spends time at the ARQ nightclub. In 2007, the ARQ Dance Club is a very popular nightclub in Taylor Square, which is in the Darlinghurst area. Mm. And by September 2007, Matthew meets somebody while out and he thinks he might want to actually entertain a real relationship with him. His name is Michael Atkins and the two of them just hit it off. Now, Michael Atkins is much older than Matthew, more than double his age at wow. 44 years old. Whoa. Mm -hmm. So 24 year difference? Yes. That's, that's pretty big. Right. And they um, met at the club, right? Yes. They okay. met just like out in the scene. They kind of ran around in the same circles. Gotcha. Um, but to them, the age difference doesn't really matter. They begin dating and they eventually actually move in together rather quickly. Michael has an apartment in Cronulla where Matthew is now living with him. And Cronulla wow. is a beachfront area of Sydney, Australia. Do you know like how far into the relationship? They started living together? Just, Just a couple curious. months. Okay. Just a mm. couple months in. Mm -hmm. So Michael and Matthew by September have now been dating for a couple months and they together are living this party lifestyle. They like going to clubs. They are really living up Matthew's 20s because Michael is no longer in his 20s. And they are known to often take ecstasy and the party drug GHB. And there are actually numerous published reports that they might also sell small quantities of these drugs oh. while out. So they're kind of like the little interesting, the little dealers. They were taking GHB for fun. Yeah. What's a GHB? It's also known as the, the date, date rape, rape drug. drug. Oh, okay. Yes. I didn't know that. Interesting. I've never. I yeah. I mean, I'm not that much of a partier myself. So right. I, you know, I don't really know if that's common, but I've never heard of that yeah. personally taking that uh -huh. for fun. Yeah. Uh, it's usually like what I assume people would put in water so they could then rape. Somebody. Yeah, it's a yeah, liquid. Yeah. It's a liquid or syringe. Not even just, I mean, it's really common nowadays. I know someone who even um, it's a danger to males, even if, you know, they're not actually going to take advantage of you sexually. Yeah. Like they'll they'll uh, rob you or steal oh. your car. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then it's, it's really scary. You got to be so careful at bars these days and make sure your drink is always covered or you always have an eye on it yeah. because Crazy. they'll go and do like a line of people's drinks and then kind of scan and see who mm. really is affected oh, and then man. target them. Like you got to be really careful. That's nuts. Okay. Uh, yeah. You saw that um, shark tank, that girl made a scrunchie. Who that yes. at oh. the bars that goes over your dreams? Yes, I saw that. Yeah, genius. So genius. Yeah. It's happened to at least a couple. Yeah, several friends that I know, oh, and know. my mom's been uh, so my aunt. Like it's, it's scary. It's really common. Wow. Okay. Yeah. So yeah, I don't know. According to sources, they are taking and selling GHB at these. That's interesting. At these clubs. Now, as it seems to go in these stories. The relationship between Matthew and Michael Atkins starts out well, but it slowly begins to deteriorate. One woman says that Michael is very controlling of his younger boyfriend, Matthew, and the relationship had maybe even turned physical. A couple times, she says that she saw Michael once hit Matthew with a clenched mm. fist. Another person says that he himself was having a relationship with Michael at the same time that Matthew was. Oh, wow. And that Matthew knew about it. So Michael was dating more than one person. And Michael would regularly suggest threesomes or foursomes. Although dating Matthew, it seemed like Michael was not quite ready for a monogamous lifestyle. Mm. And as Michael and Matthew continue dating, rumors begin to spread around their peers and friends that possibly 44-year-old Michael is just using 20-year-old Matthew as a means to get access to additional young men. 
Because he's 44, these young men might not normally entertain him, but because he's dating this attractive 20 year old, they might then entertain him. Okay. So he's agreed to date him solely for the purpose that it allows him to gain access to much younger men that he can then kind of fool around with. So hence the issues that begin to arise between the couple because Matthew's not necessarily down with all of this. Mm -hmm. So in August 2007, Matthew Levison and Michael Atkins, like I said, are a few months into their relationship. And at Michael's request, they have a threesome with a 20-year-old man who afterwards shares the same concern that Michael is using Matthew as an entree for meeting other young men. The three take GHB together that night, but after the threesome, the third man feels that the encounter may have done some damage to Matthew and Michael's relationship. So he doesn't go into detail as to why, but obviously Matthew is not down with what is happening. These threesomes, Michael having other boyfriends, he doesn't like it and it's causing contention in their relationship. It seems like at the very beginning, there is some misunderstanding at what the relationship was actually going to be. Mm-hmm. Right. That they each had a different maybe purpose for the relationship. And as it's evolving, they're starting to kind of uncover the real reasons for why yeah. they're together in the first place. And Matthew, you know, had a completely, he was thinking, you know, maybe there's this guy that I can really be with and maybe sees a long-term future with but yeah. Michael's, which makes me wonder how many other guys before Matthew right. did Michael yeah. have where he was doing this exact same thing. Because the first thing I'm thinking of, like, this guy's a predator. Yeah. Like, he's yeah. totally yeah. preying upon these young men and he's yep. using using them to, at his disposal to yeah. gain access. So, yeah, no, I totally agree. It's so interesting you say that and I'll come back around to it at the very end of the story, but that comes up again, that exact mm. thought. Mm. Um, how many other men right. have there been? Right. It's, it's almost like they have a true crime podcast. Almost. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I guess I know something. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So around this time, Matthew actually complains to a coworker that Michael just wants to engage in threesomes. He's not very serious about the relationship and that he thinks he's, quote, God's gift to men. Uh This is according to the Weekend Australian. So he's not even talking very nice about his older boyfriend. He is obviously frustrated with what's happening. Seems like he's like a serious narcissist. Yeah, I kind of am getting that vibe even from the people who hang around with them. So despite the issues arising, on Saturday night, September 22nd, 2007, Matthew and Michael go to the ARQ nightclub. They're regulars here, like we've talked about. And it's a typical evening with Matthew dancing and enjoying time with his friends. This is including Michael, where they're all drinking and doing what's known as party drugs. That evening, Matthew is wearing light brown cargo shorts, a black singlet, and white leather shoes. This is according to the Sydney Morning Herald. And a singlet is known in the U.S. as a sleeveless shirt. I guess they just call it oh, something different. I singlet. didn't know that. There's lots yeah. of those. I thought yeah. you meant like an actual, isn't like what wrestling? wrestlers wear? Isn't yes. that, that's called a singlet, right? Yes. Okay. I believe so, oh, I yeah. yeah. So in the U.S. That's, that's what, what I thought is. you were talking about. No. So I okay. guess in Australia, this is just like a cutoff tank is okay. what I'm assuming. Huh. So Matthew's black shirt also has the word Morgan written across the front in very large letters. So the man who had the threesome with them the previous month is also at the club this night and he sees Matthew and he says that he's looking happy. Like Matthew looks like he's having a good time. However, this will change as the night progresses. Many people report that Matthew and Michael begin to have a heated argument at the club this evening. Mm -hmm. This account comes primarily from Matthew's own brother, Peter, who also happens to be partying at the club that night. And according to him, as Peter walks up to approach his brother and say hi, Matthew brushes him off and keeps walking by him when they encounter each other. And this is clearly unusual behavior for Matthew as he's usually so friendly and upbeat. He's the life of the party. So why would he just like bypass his brother? Okay, wait. So just to clarify. So they're at the club. Yes. Matthew's with Michael. Yeah. And then Matthew's brother, Peter, walks by him, tries to say hi, and Matthew just blows it off. Yes. He seems like he's in a bad mood, basically. Hmm. Um, So curious as to what's going on with Matthew, why he was too upset to even talk to him. Peter begins asking around and he finds out from someone else that Matthew is fighting with Michael. And that's the reason he's visibly upset. So Peter says he thought that his brother's boyfriend, Michael, was a nice guy. But this night, his opinion begins to change 
because while his brother Matthew and boyfriend Michael are arguing, Michael starts inappropriately coming on to Peter as well. So he literally begins wow. trying to hit up his boyfriend's own brother while fighting. Wow. Oh my God. With his boyfriend. Like, yeah. Like you said earlier, he really seems like a narcissist. Yes. Yeah. So Peter will later say that Michael Atkins gets creepy close to him in the bar and he's not the only one. Michael Atkins was kind of known to be very handsy, would make people uncomfortable, um, yeah. would advance on people all the time who definitely didn't want it. And it was one of those things where everyone just kind of acknowledged him as this guy and but brushed it off. We're like, oh, that's just Michael. He That's just kind of who he is. Mm. And I think it even plays more into the story that Michael is 44 partying with 20 year olds and being the guy who's just a little too creepy, a little too touchy at yeah. the same time. Mm -hmm. And usually it's, it's the opposite. Um, kind of what Josh was saying earlier that the 44 year old should be looking to settle and the 20 year old should be looking to party. Right. But it's like the opposite, opposite. in their, in yeah. their situation. Well, that's why I'm, I'm saying, you know, I'm starting to think he's a predator, right? Yeah. yeah. There's a reason that he's doing this. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it's not just to find like a loving husband to go, yeah, you yeah. know, live with. Like he's, which is, you know, not to say that anyone that's dating someone younger is a predator. Yeah. But no, right. age when is his, just a number. Yeah, yeah. don't get sure. me wrong. Sure, but, age is just a number. But him, yeah. yes, God's gift to man. Yes. Yeah, yeah. I feel like whenever you bring up, you compare yourself to you God. Know, yeah, God yeah. and Jesus. Yeah. Usually, yeah. It's, <laughs> it's usually narcissists or mm -hmm. predators. I feel like that happens right. a lot. Oh, totally. Yeah. Well, Cult he clearly. Leaders. Michael clearly feels like he has power yes. oh. in the in this situation and mm -hmm. in this club. Yep. He's a regular, he's a drug dealer. Mm -hmm. So he has yeah. something <laughs> he has something that people want. Yep. But he's also clearly been around for a long time. And yeah. so he's kind of created this reputation for himself that, you know, he's kind of powerful in a sense yep. in right. this setting. And people have seen him physically get violent with Michael. Mm. Wow. With Matthew. Yeah. So, so that's maybe scared hard. of him even. Yeah. 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 So it's safe to say that this night out between Matthew and Michael is quickly turning into a Ronnie cheating on Sammy Jersey Shore type of <laughs> oh, party yes. night. We're okay. flipping Familiar. beds. We're dragging them out. Like, mm. I mean, obviously they're not flipping mm -hmm. beds, but it's just like they're all at this party and they're in a fight at the club. And if you've watched Jersey Shore, oh, yeah. you know how Lots that goes. That. You yeah. know about the letter. Yeah, yes. the letter. The letter. <laughs> Classic. <laughs> So Matthew and Michael Atkins have been arguing and it's now in the wee hours of Sunday morning, September 23rd, 2007. No, oh, no. And at least one witness notices that Matthew at this point is visibly under the effects of drugs as the morning hours roll around. And at approximately 2 a.m., Matthew decides to leave the ARQ dance club for the night morning. Um, and this is captured on video. He's seen leaving, walking out with and just ahead of his boyfriend, Michael. And it appears like they are leaving for the night together. I mean, they do live together and they both walk out. They are standing a little bit apart, though. Mm -hmm. But something peculiar happens just 55 minutes later after leaving at approximately 3 a.m., Michael returns to the ARQ club only now he's by himself. Okay. So he left with Matthew, but now he's coming back on his own. An hour later. Gosh, that's late to, sh to come back. Right. 3 yes. a.m. But before you get ahead of yourself. Yeah, but who, I mean, who, I don't know, who leaves the club and then comes back I think a lot later, of people. Yeah. Right? Ronnie. Like, so? <laughs> yeah. I guess that's true. Not me. Yeah. Okay, I guess, Not, yeah, yeah, see? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I feel like it's a little strange, right? Well, to leave I the think club and then come just, back. And it's mm -hmm. at 3 a.m. It's not like it's 10 o'clock and they're leaving, right. coming back at like yeah, midnight yeah. or something. It's a weird time to yeah. show up. It's like it's yeah. bedtime at 4 a.m., 5 a.m. Right. Yeah. But if we are tracking texts being sent from Matthew's phone, he is supposedly still okay. But when asked later where he and Matthew were during this time, Michael says he doesn't remember. So Michael can't account for the 55 minutes he and Matthew were gone. But we know that Matthew is still alive because he was sending texts during this time. Yes. Are we sure that he was the one composing said text? No. Okay. Mm. But his phone is sending texts during this 55 minutes. Okay. And Michael just says, I can't remember what happened. Yeah. According to mm. him, he has no recollection. So Which could be possible. Since could be. They were. Yeah. I mean, that's one of the side effects of GHB. Yes. I was also going to say, sorry to jump in. I was also okay. going to say 
that this club, you know, we're saying 3 a.m. He's coming back to the club kind of weird. This is actually still like early in the night for or early in the morning for the club because the club closes at 7 a.m. Mm. This okay. Yes. Club? And this oh, club wow. is still open and today. So people Dang. party till 7 a.m. It starts at yeah. 9 p.m. all the way to 7. So they're like serving mimosas. So like 3 a.m. Yeah. 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 <laughs> <laughs> 3 a.m. I mean, it's still the, prime time. Yeah. 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 There's That's like true. breakfast burritos starting at 6 <laughs> yeah. a.m. You know, that is <laughs> mimosas come out. Yeah. yeah. Definitely not me. Yeah. Definitely not. Well, and also, too, you got to think when you're using drugs too, when you're using party drugs, things like that, yes. I mean, time is completely distorted and True. I'm not yeah. saying that I have experience with that, but yeah, <laughs> I'm just saying like, from what I know about party drugs yeah. is that, you know, your sense of time and, um, just your overall well being is kind of off, right? right. Your, your yeah. consciousness is altered. And totally. so right. it does allow you to stay it, up later too. Yeah. I mean, it's easy to go from nine to seven. No problem. Yeah. Yep. Makes sense. If you've got some help. So, okay. Yeah. That makes sense. So at some point after this, now physically separated, we know this because of security mm -hmm. footage, Michael sends Matt's phone a text, quote, I already apologized three times and also that he needed to get more drugs for a friend, which maybe he's explaining why he's going back to the club. Mm -hmm. um, and meanwhile, Matthew, as we said, is no longer at the club and his phone is texting a friend about the argument that he's been having with Michael this whole entire night. At 3.20 a.m., a text says, Mike's having an effing cry. He is taking me home and he won't let me stay. Effing C word. At 3.41 a.m., another text to a friend. He needs to effing get over himself. So things are just messy. They're toxic. They're not going good right now if this is really M Matthew sending Michael these texts. Which is already suspicious, at least in my head. But it's confusing to me because... Matthew is at home at this point. Yes. That's Michael's true. at the club. So it's not like Michael could have been sending these texts from Matthew's phone. Unless he had unless it. Unless he stole it, I guess. Yes. Oh, unless he brought it with yes. him. Were they able to trace cell phone data and see where not they Not that I saw on any of the case sources. Okay. I'm going to say, it, because I know the outcome of this case, I do... I, I believe Matthew is the one sending these texts. Okay. I okay. don't think that 55 minutes, I don't know what happened during those 55 minutes. I think he's still alive at and this point. He's the one that said, called uh, Michael effing, see you next Tuesday. Yes, yes. Gotcha. see you next Tuesday. So after this, Michael leaves the club once again. And according to him, he goes home. Michael says that he and Matthew are both home for the rest of the night, but that they sleep in separate rooms because of the arguments. And after waking up that Sunday, Michael buys two tickets to an upcoming event called the Sleaze Ball, which is a gigantic dance party that's coming up. And just two days later, on Tuesday, September 25th, Matthew Levison doesn't show up for work. Okay, so this is where this is where we're getting started. Yes. Mm -hmm. When Matthew's family learns that he doesn't show up for work on Tuesday, they keep trying his phone, but Matthew's not answering. And other than his brother, Peter, who saw him at the club that Saturday, his family last saw Matthew at a birthday party about two weeks earlier. So Peyton and I always talk about this, and I'm curious to hear your guys' thoughts. Like, how long would it take for you guys to be gone for people to start to say, I think something's happened? Like, how long for your mom or your dad would it take to not hear Janelle. from you or huh. Janelle? I mean, I, I guess Janelle or people Dang. that you work with. Yeah, no, no you can say yeah. that. Can that. <laughs> I guess like Janelle or like people you work with, probably pretty fast. But what about like your mom or your dad? Janelle would be the first one to freak. To know. Okay. And that actually happened recently. I don't know what happened. How many hours? Like us, a day, 12 hours? It was like four hours before oh, okay. they started freaking out. <laughs> okay. Um, but, we have a pact with every, yeah. all yeah, our employees. Good. Like if. You don't hear from us for an hour. Please call 911. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Good. That's smart, Something though. has happened. You can't get hold of yeah. both of us. If, you, if yeah. I couldn't get a hold of you, I'd freak out an hour. Yeah. Okay. Really? Yeah. An hour? I can't go if anywhere an hour and not talk to you. If I knew where you were or why you weren't answering, yes. God, I can't I, just if like, I'm expecting just to get a hold of you. Tiptoe out of the house and disappear. Yeah. Yeah. You have about an hour, Josh. Than, I feel like our parents wouldn't know for a long time. My parents would know for a month. At least, <laughs> okay. Probably, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it was probably a month. I'd say about a week for my mom and maybe three days for my dad. Okay. That's okay. A, that's kind of what I feel is. What's your answer? Probably for them? three days to a week for my parents. Yeah. Your parents love you. Yeah, my parents love me. <laughs> Just yeah, they love me. No, my parents would freak out if I didn't answer for a day. Really? Yeah, mm. we we talk that much. But for me and Garrett, this actually happened recently. My mm. phone wasn't working. Garrett 
broke his foot and was trying to get a hold of me oh, to no. have to take him to the hospital. And my phone wasn't working. And so he couldn't get a hold of me for like 35 minutes. And he was <sighs> freaking out text because I was home alone and he was freaking out texting me over Great. and over and over hey. again. Yeah, that's true. So it was pretty fast for us. So I had to call wow. a friend instead to come pick me up and <laughs> surprise, we're still married. <laughs> oh my god, that's crazy. Was that? Yeah. yeah, he was, was mad. That? He texted me, he said, I'm gonna take away your phone. Is like, that I was turn your phone daughter. off? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I was like, babe, what if I was kidnapped? Please couldn't get old of me. But yeah, oh, it was no, it was pretty funny. That's crazy. Okay, so that's good to know because I always wonder like how long before. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's an curious. interesting thought. Yes. So Matthew's family is worried. And after doing a little investigation of their own, it appears that no one other than Michael has seen Matthew since early Sunday morning at the club when he walked out with Michael. That's the last time he was seen. Mm. Understanding the gravity of the situation at this point, Matthew's family is concerned that Matthew could possibly have become a victim of a hate crime. And so they report him missing to the police. And when I was researching this, I had a sudden just heart dropping moment of this is so sad that a family immediately has to jump to this conclusion when their son is gay. Because mm -hmm. if I didn't answer mm -hmm. for true. a day, my parents wouldn't go, my daughter was a victim of a hate crime. Yeah. That wouldn't be the first thing that they would think. But but Matthew's family had to think that. It's, yeah, it's so true. I was going to also say, let alone the time he left. Right. I mean, for anybody mm -hmm. to be out at 3 a.m., potentially intoxicated, yeah, walking around, you know, because all we have is the CCTV footage, yeah. right? We don't know how he actually got home. We don't have any of that information. So maybe they walked for a few blocks right. in the dark mm -hmm. and something happened. I mean, your mind goes to all those different yeah. scenarios yeah. that play out. And, but yeah, obviously because he's, he's openly gay, yep. you know, yeah. there's always that possibility. Of, yeah. I, I was going to say, I don't know if it's gotten much better since 2007. I mean, mm -mm. I feel like yeah. things have gotten possibly it's just worse scary, yeah. in the last few years. I mean, it's just kind of been on the rise. 100%. Yeah. yeah. Maybe. I don't know. Yeah. No, it's no, so true. Like if I went missing at 3 a.m. intoxicated, my parents would think, oh no, she was sexually assaulted. Mm -hmm. yes. If Matthew goes missing at 3 a.m. intoxicated, they think, oh no, he was a victim of a hate crime. He's been killed. Yeah. yeah. So meanwhile, on Tuesday, September 25th, or Wednesday, September 26th, depending on the source, um, but in either event, right when Matthew's family is reporting him missing to the police because they think he might be a victim of a hate crime, Michael, his live-in boyfriend, is driving about two hours north to Newcastle straight from work to go have sex with the man he's been having the online sexual relationship with. Mm. So while his boyfriend's family are reporting him missing, he's going to have sex with another man. And this will be the first time they actually physically get together. That's so messed up. Yeah. So mm. at this encounter, Michael offers this man a ticket to the sleaze ball, saying that he now magically has an extra ticket to this dance if this man wants to go with him. At 10.13 a.m. that Tuesday, Michael then sends Matthew's phone a text that says, baby, no matter what happened, just give me a call. Please, baby, we are all worried sick. I don't know if he was that worried if he was off hanging out with his other friend while the family was so worried that they were going to police. Yeah. So after reporting to police, the first real break in Matthew's disappearance comes to light two days later, Thursday, September 27th. Matthew's car, a 1999 Corolla hatchback, is found in the Watara Park Reserve, parked near a public toilet. It's at Watara Oval in Sutherland. This is not far from where Matthew lives with Michael. So they now find his abandoned car. Mm -hmm. The police search Matthew's car and discover a receipt inside for two items that were bought shortly after noon on Sunday, September 23rd. So this was the day Matthew seemed to have disappeared. This would basically be the afternoon after that toxic night out where Matthew was last seen. The two items on this receipt are duct tape and a mattock, which is like a hammer. Oh, oh my God. gosh. And the purchase was made with cash. So it's not clear from the receipt who made the purchase. Why are the receipts in the car? Yeah. That's weird. People don't think things through. Yeah, they no. do not. No. Especially when it might be a last minute, not really yeah, premeditated true. thing. You're not really right. calculated. Thinking, right? yeah. Right. yeah. Which I think that's an important thing to note, especially when you get, you know, farther into this, because it, that's what it indicates, right? Is like this 
probably was kind of a spur of the moment thing because if yep. you're really planning something out, you, you know, if you're that. planning to murder somebody, you're going to do your best to cover your tracks, right? Yeah. So, yeah. yep. So as you can imagine, this receipt feels very ominous considering Matt is missing now. And the police begin investigating to figure out who bought these items. And I should clarify, the duct tape and the Matic are not found in the car. Just the receipt is in the car. Okay. Police believe that Matthew didn't park his car there himself with the receipt. And because of this, they believe very early on that Matthew has met with foul play. They don't think he's just an adult who decided to run away. Mm. At this point, law enforcement publicly asks for anyone who has information about Matthew to come forward or about how his car even came to be parked in that area. And another odd thing the police discover about Matthew's car is that there are a lot of loose wires in the trunk as though something electronic had been ripped out of it. Huh. And the police talk to Matthew's family to try and figure out what this was. And they learn that a large speaker is missing from from the trunk a speaker out of all th that's weird well matthew was known to love this speaker it's oh. described either as a giant subwoofer or a large boom box i'm going to just say a it's subwoofer. a sound system probably, yeah. for mm -hmm. the subwoofer, car yeah, yeah it's likely. now missing and according to sbs.com the speaker had been crudely removed like it had been physically Quickly. ripped out of the trunk peter says that matthew would never have ripped out this speaker out of his own trunk like this and I want to mention for a picture here, the subwoofer was so large, it had taken up basically the entire trunk of Matthew's car. So wow. say someone needed to place something else oh. in the trunk of Matthew's car, his beloved speaker was most definitely in the way and would need to be ripped out. Oh, that makes a lot of sense because when you first said that, my mind was going to, could this have been a robbery uh, that yeah, went yeah. south? Yep. But... They needed room in the back. I it was that big. Yeah, yeah. I didn't even think about that. Yeah. Wow. That makes. Well, police yeah. did. Yeah. Yeah. That's why they're the police and I am on a podcast. Yes. That's right. <laughs> yep. <laughs> so police, of course, at this point, interview Michael Atkins, who voluntarily agrees to talk because just like all of you, police want to know what happened to Michael after leaving the club that night. Like, what's the story here? Yeah. He hasn't been seen since. So where did he go? What happened? Michael gives the police an account of what he claims happened the day and night of Matthew's disappearance. He says that Matthew had taken drugs when they were at the club and that Matthew was falling asleep, so he drove him to their shared home. Michael says he doesn't know what took them so long or why that took 55 minutes because it shouldn't have, but then he went back to the club. Then he, after the club, he went home and went back to sleep. He claims that he was then home all day with Matthew on Sunday, September 23rd. So when whoever bought that receipt and left it in the car, he's claiming he was home with Matthew during that time. According to him, the only time they left during the day was at about 5 p.m. to walk through the mall. Michael claims that he's seen and spent time nearly a whole day with missing Matthew since they left the nightclub. So that's his story is Matthew was around all Sunday. He says that Matthew then left sometime on Sunday night and didn't come back and he hasn't seen him since. Michael says that for all he knows, Matthew is alive and well. When confronted about going and having sex with another lover while Matthew was being reported missing, he said, quote, it just seemed like the right time to do it. Oh my god! Because he hadn't met this guy yet. And the police were wow. like, why would you go do this while your boyfriend's being reported missing? And he said, well, we just hadn't met yet. And it just seemed like the right time. Nope. Makes a ton of sense. Nope. Right. The police decide to search Michael's garage at this point, And they make a puzzling discovery. Matthew's ripped out speaker is sitting on the garage floor. So, what? It, I mean, it seems like at this point... I mean, I'm not going to say an open and shut case, but I mean, the speaker's literally in yeah. his garage. Yeah. It seems kind of like a, a yeah. slam dunk situation. Yeah. He was the last one who police. saw him. Yeah. yeah. Everything. You would think. Yeah. You would think. So the police hmm. theory is that somebody who they now suspect to be Michael removed the speaker to make room to transport Matthew's body after he killed him. Around this time, they've finally tracked down the surveillance video from the Bunnings hardware store in Terran Point, where the suspicious receipt from the car came from. And because I don't have a very good history on our podcast with hardware stores versus grocery stores, I did look it up. <laughs> and Bunnings is a store similar to Home Depot in the U.S. Do you guys know what Menards is? 
No. Okay. Yeah, See, we. we are not the only one. It's because <laughs> we're from the West Coast. So Menards is a, what is it again? It's a grocery store. Oh, shoot. Oh, no. Menards is either a grocery store or a hardware store In on the, the East Coast. One of the two. And we, whatever we, we said, said was, was wrong. We said it was vice versa on our podcast because we didn't look it up. I was just assuming. Okay. To this day. We still get messages yeah, people, daily. People won't let it about down. About what Menards is. Yeah. Wow. It's Apparently. home improvement. Home, home so improvement. So it is. Okay. okay home there improvement. You go. So we said it was a grocery store, and everyone was like, "Are you insane? Are you dumb? No. Nope. It's, it's like it's like calling an Ace Hardware like a grocery store. Yeah. That's basically okay. what we did. Yeah. 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 So. But that's that's a little weird to hang on to that. Oh, yeah. They I do. Know. They the are. Very, I know. I just got tagged in a TikTok yesterday that was like a Menards theme song, and someone tagged me. It was like, "Just for you." That's oh my so God. funny. That's funny. That's funny. Police watch the video, and who do you think they find on camera purchasing the duct tape and the matic? Michael. It's actually not super clear, hmm. like, footage, but it definitely looks like him. But just for concrete evidence, police also check the receipt for fingerprints, and they find a fingerprint on the receipt that belongs to Michael Atkins as well. Michael, however, denies to the police that he made those purchases and he denies that it's him on the videotape and he doesn't know how his fingerprint got on the receipt. So that is some seriously solid evidence right there. I would agree. That feels pretty solid to me. I I mean, at this point, I assume it's Michael. Like, oh. I assume it has to be Michael. Yeah. Um, it's definitely looking that way. Yeah. Well, despite the evidence, police want to find Matthew before they make an arrest. But months start going by, they keep going by, and Matthew doesn't turn up. It's difficult, though, because there's no body and there's really no physical evidence to speak of to show murder. Mm. So if they want to get him for murder, it will be tough. The two live together, so their DNA would be all over the car and all over the, you know, home's possessions. There was apparently no blood evidence found in the home or Matthew's car. And the only thing they have is an extremely suspicious receipt found in Matthew's car that was left there by Michael and extremely obvious circumstantial evidence. Neither of those are strong enough to get a first degree murder conviction in court. So police feel a little stuck. I mean, it is really hard without a body. It makes it way more difficult. Yes. Did they do... Any ground searches? Like, did they look at the Watara? Is it uh, Watara? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I don't know reserve? if they were. I'm sure they were because they were still searching for him at this point, the family and police, but they weren't finding anything that would like help aid the investigation. I, went, I wonder if they brought in canines or anything. I was kind of looking last night. It didn't seem like they yeah. did anything like that. I, I know the family that had was to reported. Search. That was mm -hmm. reported. Interesting. I mean, just, they totally could have, yeah. and it's just not. Which well, it wouldn't have been that hard to search that area where the car was found because the Watara uh, Park Reserve is literally just like a city park. Kind yeah. Of thing. Oh, it's yeah. just like, so it's small. There, yeah, there's like three fields and with like a cycling far, track around it. It's not far from all this open the Royal land. The Royal National Park is not oh, far. Yeah. So it kind of yeah. backs up to maybe yeah, a so national there's a park in a way. big highway, though, that runs in beneath, uh, between the two. Okay. Um, the one thing I was thinking of is like, did law enforcement ever like look at other cameras around town? I know, or, yeah. or around you know their where they live to see if the you know they can see Michael and uh, Matthew in the car together driving. Yeah, yeah. it might be different over out. there about how much they share with the public as far as their tactics That's that they true. take. Yeah. I was about to say that because they're definitely it definitely feels a little underreported. Okay, um, as far as like evidence goes in this case, I feel like a lot of the information was very regurgitated, mm. um, and that they weren't necessary. And I guess once we get to the trial and everything, it might make sense as to why it was never publicly released. Mm -hmm. Um, but yeah, I definitely feel like there's some missing holes here. I I was watching an interview. Um, with Matthew's parents and they seem to be very happy with the work yes. the police did and I felt agree. like they oh. did a thorough job even okay. though they were involved in the searches and they yeah. described it as being a needle in a haystack kind of situation mm -hmm. didn't know where to start can't imagine what that's like you know and maybe it's one of those cases where police really did a good job of communicating with the family mm -hmm. and so the family does is happy even if that information hasn't been released to the public which yeah. i wish would happen more often mm -hmm. they need to know more than we do yeah, you know it's so true so by july 2008 matthew's mother posts a heartfelt tribute and a plea on facebook that made it very clear where the family stood on their son's disappearance it says 
my darling, beautiful boy. It is 10 months today since that heartless, soulless monster took you away from your family and friends. Oh my gosh. My resolve has not weakened. I will not stop looking for you and bring that monster to justice. It is only a matter of time. Even if it takes me my lifetime, I will get justice for you. Every night I look into the sky and I see your star shining brightly. You are a bright star in our lives and will continue to be so forever. The monster may have taken you from me, but it can't take my memories and my love for you away. You will never be forgotten. You are forever in our hearts. They say time heals. It's a lie. It does not. It just gets harder and harder not having you around. Maddie, I love you now, always, and forever, XOXO. That is heartbreaking. That really is. Heart-wrenching. But it goes to show you the family definitely believes they know who did it. Mm -hmm. They just need the evidence. And they believe he's deceased at this point. Yes. Yes. I think you can tell from that wording. If they said a monster, it'd be different. But that monster tells you they know in their minds who did this. And I'm sure maybe it'll be information that we won't ever know. I wonder how his family even felt about Michael. Oh, the all, relationship in, in the first place. Well, Correct. it did say that the brother thought he was nice until that night when. Oh, okay. Um, so maybe they were fine with it then. Michael did start hitting on him and he was like, whoa, mm. you're dating my brother. Okay. Mm. Got it. So months are ticking by at this point, but the investigation has been ongoing according to most sources. On August 6, 2008, almost a year after Matthew's disappearance, the police believe enough time has passed without Matthew resurfacing. And so Michael Atkins is charged with Matthew Levison's murder. So I think they were waiting. They were waiting around for that year mark to see, does do we ever find the body? Do we ever find anything else? Does someone ever come forward? And when nothing happened, they said, okay, we're just going to go with what we have and hope that we have enough. To, yeah. to, to get with it. Interesting. Mm. So just risk it on the trial, basically. Yep. They're like, yeah. hey, we're just going to arrest him and go for it. It's kind of like a last resort. That happens yeah. with a lot of yes. cases. Okay. Yeah. Mm. yeah. So Atkins is arrested at 7 a.m. I'm going to start referring to him as Atkins now that he's officially arrested for the crime. He's arrested at 7 a.m. at home at his apartment, and Atkins is now 45 years old. The police hold a press conference announcing that the investigation is ongoing and that just because they made an arrest doesn't mean they're going to stop looking for Matthew, which is, I I feel like they're just doing such a good job Mm -hmm. to reassure the public, like, just because we've made an arrest doesn't mean we think our work is over. Like, we're still looking for him. We're still going to try to bring his body home. It seems like for the most part, the Australian police are really top notch. Yeah, Yeah. I'd agree. Seems like they have feelings and yeah, yeah. You know, like, <laughs> it's a they, human being. Yeah. Yeah. You know, not saying that all cops don't have feelings, but of it's of course not. And yeah. it's also you also no, have to sure. remember crime rates over here much, yeah, much higher much than higher than yeah. Australia. Yeah, 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 so yeah. so when someone does go missing or something at least like violent crime rate yes. is a lot higher here. So that's a good murder's point. not as like a you know, here yeah. we hits like every every day there's something Normal. going on. There's yeah. a shooting or a murder or something like that. But over yeah. there it's a lot Right. Rare that stuff like this Multiple happens. Multiple every day. Yeah. When yeah. we have like 50 cases a week from Florida. Yeah. You yeah. Know, and <laughs> oh, yeah. yeah. Definitely Florida. Yeah. So police say that although they have no body, they have formed a strong circumstantial case against Atkins for murder. As quoted in the Sydney Morning Herald, police superintendent Mark Hiron says, quote, a whole series of small pieces of information came together to lead us to the conclusion that there is no other reasonable hypothesis. Matthew's parents join police at the press conference and plead for the return of Matthew's body. And little over a year after Michael's arrest, the jury trial against him begins on September 3rd, 2009 in the New South Wales Supreme Court. It's a four-week trial and Atkins reportedly shows no emotion throughout the entirety of the trial. Now, I'm going to kind of skip over the details of the trial, um, But basically, it's the case you already know. That's kind of how it's represented. And the defense is that, hey, there is no body. Basically, Matthew could still be alive. That's their Nobody, no crime. Yep, nobody, no crime. So the jury deliberates for five days. And again, just like Kendall said, no body cases aren't impossible, but they are notoriously difficult to prosecute because the defense can point to multiple alternative theories, including the theory that perhaps Matthew is still alive. I mean, that's what it's all about, creating that reasonable doubt. And it yep. gives you way more opportunity to do that. And that's all you need. I think mm-hmm. I think it's so hard, actually, to... Yeah, if there's no evidence, 
There's no body. If there's they no can't body, even prove he was murdered. It would be hard. If I was on a jury, I I don't know what I would do. That's just that, yeah. that's hard. Have you guys ever been like a jury duty? Have you guys ever been? I would love to. I've never had the opportunity. Never had opportunity. I was called in once and they canceled it. They canceled it. But I would probably be. I'm so emotional and yeah. like I always take the family side. I'm just so same. Yeah, it'd be so hard. empathetic that I just I don't know if I could be unbiased enough to. I also feel to like because of your career. Yeah. Yeah. We're counted out. There's no like, way they'd ever. Sorry, let Kendall. Us sorry, Josh. Yeah, you guys. No way. <laughs> I just pretend I don't know what. Yeah. True crime is. Be like, like huh? what? <laughs> I don't know what's going on. You just perjure yourself. <laughs> I was <laughs> actually. I was the last time I went to jury duty. I made it into the courtroom. Wow. And I was about to go and start getting questioned uh -huh. and stuff. And they just filled up the jury. And it was a really interesting case. It was actually, uh, I believe it was a guy who, uh, it was like a DUI case where the guy fell asleep and he ended up wrecking. And I believe he injured somebody severely. Wow. Um, but then the whole thing was like, he had a medical condition. And, oh, interesting. And so there's this, it, was, it would have been a really interesting mm. case to be a part of, but yeah. wow. I missed it by like two people. Dang. That's yeah, crazy. they, they failed the jury and they're like, all right, sorry guys. I was like, dang it. I was dang, like, yeah, I you was were close. You're like, Kendall, I'm out for the next yeah. two yeah. months. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I would have hated that. <laughs> <laughs> We've, I've never been. Me, me either. neither. Have you done jury duty? No. No, neither I've of us have ever any. been. Maybe we shouldn't put that out there. They're going to call us. Yeah. Or maybe we have been and we just missed it. We just maybe. don't even know. <laughs> wow. Yeah. yeah so, I've had it a couple times. I know. It's weird. On October 20th, 2009, after five days of deliberations, the jury finds Michael Atkins not guilty of murder and not guilty of manslaughter. Wow. After how many what? days? Five days. Michael Atkins wow. walks out of court a free man well it must have been quite contested if it took them five days to come to that conclusion i so agree and also i think that the the defense just did a good job of going you can't even prove he's murdered like we we, we don't even have a body and so i yeah. think the jury was just in a tough spot ah, it's hard because yeah. i sit here and i'm like he has the speaker yeah yeah and he walked out with him last fingerprints on that receipt yeah. he there's bought fingerprints on the receipt they could make the argument he's he's alive and he chose at his own free will to leave yeah, yeah. he's out there somewhere yeah. Obviously, this no, it's true. very unlikely, and none of us feel that way. Yeah. Right. They present that to the jury, and if there's any doubt at all, it's yeah. 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 So our case is not over, though. So we will keep going. Uh, Michael Atkins shows no emotion, even at the time of the verdicts, and Matthew's mother sobs mm. at the oh, not guilty verdicts, God. and she begs for help in getting her son's body back. That seemed to be something that was extremely important to them is Huge. at least getting his body back. Yeah. They just wanted that that closure. I totally get if that. If that's the word you can even use. Yeah. God, that is just so unbelievably yeah. painful to go through. So after this, more time will pass in Matthew's case. And although Atkins has been found not guilty, authorities still want to get to the bottom of what happened. There's a grieving family who wants answers. And the not guilty verdict has been extremely painful to the family and unsatisfactory to law enforcement as well. Everyone just wants the truth and they really want to find Matthew's body. So in 2015, eight years now after wow. Matthew's disappearance, the coroner's court decides to hold a proceeding called an inquest to investigate what happened to Matthew. Now, an inquest is a court case, but it's different than a criminal proceeding. The point of an inquest is not to determine Atkins' guilt or innocence or anyone's guilt or innocence. An inquest has a different purpose, which is to determine the circumstances surrounding Matthew's presumed death, if he is indeed dead. It's about getting answers, not justice. The coroner can compel witnesses to testify and can even compel a reluctant witness to testify who otherwise wouldn't want to because it could incriminate themselves, kind of like taking the fifth in the U.S. The coroner can give witnesses mm. immunity from prosecution in order to get them to really? talk. Really? Yes. Wow, he's that the coroner has that much power. It's basically like a last resort. Okay. On December 17th, 2015, the coroner serves Atkins with a subpoena to testify at the inquest. Atkins will fight and fight and fight to try to avoid having to testify at the inquest, but in the end, he will lose this fight. He's going to be subpoenaed to talk. Nearly another year will pass while these legal battles are ongoing about whether he will have to testify or not. But finally, in October 2016, nine years since Matthew disappeared, 
Michael Atkins finally begins testifying at the inquest. Michael Atkins testifies in coroner's court under oath for five long days. And at first, he claims that last he knew, Matthew was just fine. Atkins says that he believes that Matthew went off to start a new life in Thailand. And as far Mm. for the duct tape and the matic that were bought the day that Matthew went missing, Atkins now admits to buying those. He's like, okay, okay, you got me. That is my fingerprint, and that is me on the surveillance camera. Mm. I did buy those. So Kendall was right. He claimed that he went to Thailand. He took off by himself, and he's just doing his own thing. Which is so outlandish. Yeah. He just randomly up and leaves to Thailand. Is there any evidence to show that he was looking into Thailand or, you know, had his things arranged? Like, there's just nothing to back up someone leaving their whole life behind like that. And it seemed like he was very close with his family. I mean, why would he do that to them? And also, his passport was in Michael's house. Police found his passport. Well, then... So if he did go, he didn't use his own passport. Yeah, he which snuck is, through somehow. Yeah. No, that's impossible. Yeah. impossible. And, and like Kendall just said, I mean, Matthew was like notoriously known for being close with his family. It yeah. was like they loved him. It was a very like loving family. So he would just like get up and leave without telling anybody. Yeah. No yeah I mean, I know it happens, yeah. but it, it just doesn't seem likely. Yeah. Um, And for the duct tape and the basically hammer axe that he bought michael says that he's really big on gardening and he bought those items for a garden um he was growing zucchini he says <laughs> that, <laughs> this is what he there was no okay, proof bro. ever existed yes. yeah yeah seriously oh, i ate them they're gone oh, now. yeah <laughs> sure so i ate all the zucchini yeah so, i put concrete over it over yeah, yeah exactly yeah. yeah so people actually laugh out loud while michael atkins is testifying in the courtroom really because they find all of this so far-fetched uh, duct tape and what does that have it's to do a with gardening? Hammer? Yeah. yeah, it's, it's like, like a pickaxe. Pick, yeah, pickaxe basically. Mm. Okay. Yeah. Which you need for like the very initial step of digging out of garden bed, but you need some more tools than that. Yeah. To yeah. Use actually, a shovel garden. before you get like a hammer type thing. Probably. Yeah. Yeah. You don't really need a pickaxe. No. You're digging a big old hole. He's yeah. not like out there in a mine, like digging for gold yeah. in California somewhere. So. I don't know. Atkins also testified that he wanted to leave the ARQ bar that night because Matthew had taken so many drugs. So he's Mm. also just victim blaming here. He's like, oh, yeah, I had nothing to do with this. He says he saw Matthew alive and well after he bought the Matic and the duct tape at the hardware store that Sunday and that Matthew was getting ready to go out. He left. He never came back. Atkins also testifies that he doesn't remember whatever happened to that Matic and duct tape because he was asked to produce it to police and he couldn't ever do it. And now he's saying he doesn't know what happened to it. However, after several days of being under oath on the stand and after five days of grilling, Michael starts to be able to not keep his story straight. Of the course. lies are starting to add up. His story starts changing um, and he essentially begins to break and his story changes in a major way. Keep in mind, the Levison family's main goal here at this point is just to recover Matthew's body. They've mm-hmm. agreed to this inquest because they know that they won't ever, he won't ever serve time from this inquest. So they are just strictly trying to find the body now. Okay, wait. So you can't serve any time from the inquest? I guess I'm confused. He can, at the inquest, they can offer him immunity, basically. It's like a deal. A deal. Oh. They're putting if, on the tab- table. Yes. Yeah. He can, he, because he's lying. It's still perjury, though. So okay. he could serve time for perjury. Perjury. They can get him on the new crime he committed, the perjury. Got it. But not the murder. Right. Oh, because he's okay. basically been offered immunity to tell the truth. That kind of sucks. It, I mean, I guess majorly. for the family, if they want closure, I yeah. guess it's the best thing. But they said finding his body was the most important thing to them. Oh, so it just why sucks, this like, decision was the way. If he killed someone, the murder is just out there. Yeah. Yep. That, uh, that's and crazy. definitely also, works different than it does here. Like, yeah. That yeah. would not happen. Yeah. No. Yeah. And it also just goes to show, looking at this from the victim's family's point of view, and not just in this case, many, they're willing to give up justice yes. yeah. to get their son yeah. buried in a in a proper place. Well, and I guess if you if you don't think that justice is a pop a possibility, they may never get that. Their best bet is, is to, to, to and th- get his body. And I mean, as a parent now, I I get that. Yeah. yeah. But but how unfair to even be put in that situation. Oh, it's yeah. terrible. It's terrible. 
So he basically, Michael is forced at this point to admit that he's been lying under oath and that he's perjured himself. And this admission is huge, just like Josh said, because now he could be arrested and put in jail for that. So he now has a possibility to go to prison for that. Um, on November 7th, 2016, the attorney general grants indemnity, which is like immunity, to Michael Atkins, but only if he provides information that leads to the recovery of Matthew's body. Wow. The Levison family is on board with the immunity deal for him as finding their son's body is really all that matters now. So on November 9th, he gives the statement and then he signs it the following day. And in this statement, Atkins' entire story changes. After 10 years of denials, Michael Atkins finally admits that he knows where Matthew's body is. So this is huge. I mean, mm -hmm. he's admitting to the family, to police, and to the public that he's lied and he does know where his boyfriend is buried. Essentially admitting that he killed him. Essentially. I wanted to bring up one other thing because I think this is important to the overall context of this case. So at the inquest... They also had a number of young men that came and mm -hmm. testified in, in front of the court, in front of Matthew's family, oh. giving their own experiences and recounts of interacting with Michael. And everything that they said backs up what I was saying about him being a predator. Yep. They were saying that Michael Atkins was a creepy old man and they didn't know what Matt saw in him. And they also said that after meeting them at the beat, a local gym, uh, this is one of the men that was testifying, said that he would take men back to his flat for sex. He'd hold pool parties for porn stars. And basically he was just sexually assaulting everybody all the yeah. time. Yeah. Like at the club, he'd just be grabbing people by the butt and yeah. other body parts, Why? telling them to take their Crazy. shirts off. Just, just absolutely out of control yep. uh, predatory behavior. So that's crazy. Which obviously... Now that that's all coming out at the same time that he's also confessing to this, you can imagine the picture that Matthew's parents are now have a very clear picture yep, of right. this absolute monster. Yeah, that is Michael Atkins. He's and this is and this is also when they learn about you know the witnesses come forward saying we've seen we we saw Michael be physical with Matthew. So the parents are really learning that this relationship was not good for their son. That this was just not a good thing yeah. that had been happening. Michael Atkins gives a whole new story as to what happened. He says that when he woke up at 9 a.m. on that Sunday, he found Matthew on the floor of their bedroom and that Matthew was dead. Michael Atkins claims that he assumed that Matthew had died from an overdose. Michael Atkins claims that he then quickly decided to just dispose of Matthew's body. Keep in mind, he was trained in CPR. He didn't try to provide it. He didn't call an ambulance. He just wanted to dispose of his lover's body. So this is the final story he gives. And I think it just goes without saying, this is not what happened. No. Exactly. This is There's not no what way. happened. Who does that? Well, yes. He had duct tape and a hammer. So if he overdosed, what would be the point of having those yeah. items? Well, and yeah. also it's just... He still can't admit to it. Yes. And that's so like his yeah. ego. He just cannot admit. I don't know. He like... Yeah. He can't admit yeah. to committing murder. Nope. So Michael Atkins then draws a diagram for police of where he says he first saw Matthew's body in the apartment. And then he also provides police with a hand-drawn map of where he says he disposed of Matthew's body. He says he buried Matthew's body near the Waterfall Railway Station inside Royal National Park. So this is not the park, but the national park that, that Josh, Josh was, was talking about. Okay. So the Royal National Park is a gorgeous, absolutely enormous park area in New South Wales, about 45 minutes south of Sydney. It covers almost 40,000 wow. acres with all types of terrain. Atkins describes the shallow grave that he dug, which he says is about two meters long and about one meter wide, which is about six by three feet. He says the secret burial spot is near a sharp bend in the road on a hill, and he basically draws a map to it. Wait, and they didn't find that? In a shallow grave near the road? We'll get there. Mm. Like Okay. But police didn't find that on their own ahead of time? Well, I have an answer for you. Mm. Okay. I have an answer for you. It's coming up. Okay. On November 10th, 2016, Atkins and his lawyers, along with the police detectives, go to the scene at Royal National Park where Atkins indicates he buried Matthew's body. I'm going to summarize this next part, but it's really devastating and really important. 
At first, Atkins leads not only police, but Matthew's family around the park looking for the body. And just picture this. You're walking around with your son's killer to try to find your son's body. They're all together. All together. Oh my gosh. That's you couldn't insane. hold me back. No. I would I just can't even imagine like the that's devastation. Insane. And the reason they're together is I'm sure they didn't start out together, but he can't find the body. He can't find where he dumped it. And so it ends up being this like whole fiasco of just everyone looking and I think it was here. No, no I think it like it it's just a mess. Oh uh, no. I can't even Dang imagine it, being in that position, walking yeah. around with him. I would lose my mind. Yeah. I'd physically attack him. Yeah. I'd go to jail. Because, <laughs> I mean, it's very, I mean, especially after the inquest, now they know yeah. that yeah. he likely murdered yeah. murdered Matthew. Oh, my God. These people have some serious strength, yeah. power to them, for I, real. I feel like that wouldn't happen here. I feel like no. you could not put the parents and the killer they on the same. Yeah, I've no never way. heard they anything that in America. Yeah, and, to be there. I mean, maybe that was a first in Australia. Like, maybe it was just some wow. weird coincidence. So the land is like bushland and dense scrubby brush. So police literally need chainsaws and large excavator trucks wow. for this search. Matthew's parents are present, like I said, every step of the way. In November 2016, the area all around the site Atkins indicated is excavated and searched and searched and searched. And authorities find a white leather shoe, but they don't find Matthew's body. They don't say whether the shoe has anything to do with Matthew, though. Atkins is taken out to the area many, many times, both during the day and at night to try and jog his memories to where he buried Matthew all those years ago. Authorities spend eight days searching the area, but there's no success. They cannot find find the body. The wow. family who has been present on the scene every day of the search describes themselves as just continually being devastated. I'm I'm God. confused. So did he lie? Like, is the body actually there? I'm sure you have an answer for me, but I'm just confused. Well, authorities even place Atkins under hypnosis to trying to help him figure out what? to remember the exact spot. Wow. Um, law enforcement will search inside the vast park several times over the next six month period looking for Matthew's body. In 2017, when law enforcement isn't successful, Matthew's parents are now out on their own searching for Matthew's body. They use pickaxes and metal detectors to aid in their desperate oh search. Oh my God, these poor people. I know. That is devastating. And until this body is found, Michael Atkins will st will go on to be charged for perjury because that was the whole, whole deal. They okay. had to find the body in order for this deal to work. You either give us the body or you go to jail. Yeah. There's no yes. in between. There's no negotiation. Yeah. It's like, which one's worse? In his mind, I guess, right? I don't know. Yeah. That's well, a he's weird claiming, position he's, to be in. Yeah. He's claiming, no, no, no. This is this is where it was. He's just as confused. At least he's acting just oh, as confused. okay. In May 2017, more excavating is done um, at the scene where Atkins says he was. It's been raining hard for days. And police are finally saying, this is it. This is, we're done with the search after this six months um, and we're going to send him to jail. Like we can't find it. We don't believe him. So it's the very last day of their six month search. The police are limiting the search to where they believe Atkins could have physically been capable of carrying the body. The Levison family even allows Matthew's car to be used and Michael Atkins actually drives around the park for three days to try to simulate the night he actually drove it to dispose of the body. So the family gives the car back and says, why don't you drive it again? Just like you did that night when you had our son's body in the trunk after you ripped out his speaker and try to remember where you went. That's he, how desperate they are to find. He him. has to be lying. It's the only thing I, I don't know. I just can't imagine he's telling the truth. Unless it was such a shallow grave yeah. that it's been dug up by wildlife. animals or I something mean, i guess that's true possible. wildlife in australia is crazy yeah but you'd still think even then there'd be some remains right. yeah yeah so on the very last day of the excavation this is may 31st 2017 the backhoe belonging to the national park that's being used in the search gets stuck in the rain soaked muddy ground Everyone at this point is despondent at this latest turn with bad luck, but Matthew's parents say they'll never give up. A larger private truck at this point is called in to come out to the scene to retrieve the park's stuck backhoe. So now they're calling in basically another huge excavator truck to get this one out. This private backhoe somehow uproots a palm tree 
while helping out. So there's this palm tree and they're trying to get the one truck out and they end up accidentally digging up, like uprooting the palm tree uh, while trying to get the truck out. And everyone is just watching this from afar, absolutely defeated. I mean, imagine this. They're devastated, they're heartbroken, and now they've uprooted this huge tree and they've had to call in help. And this this search is just a failure. That's how it feels. This is just one big failure. What a nightmare. This palm tree would never have been uprooted if the private backhoe wasn't called in for help that day. Mm. This commercial backhoe ends up removing the palm tree. And the forensic team begins to kind of brush off the soil, clean up the area. They're closing shop. They're ready to go. And just two or three scrapes in, they make an unbelievable discovery. A rotted black singlet had been dug up and it revealed the letters R, G, and A on its disheveled and wow. torn surface. From Morgan. The sleeveless oh, shirt, God. the same one Michael was wow. wearing that the night he was murdered, is discovered very shallow underneath where that palm tree was. The forensic wow. team then comes across skeletal remains, including part of a skull. And so at about 2.30 p.m. on Wednesday, May 31st, the last day of the search, law enforcement finds what they believe to be Matthew's body in the Royal National Park. What they believe to be Matthew's body is found within 30 meters of where Michael Atkins said he buried it. So it was close. It was basically correct. They never found it because that palm tree had sprouted over the grave. So that palm tree somehow had just grown over the grave. So they were digging all around it, but there wouldn't be, I mean, there wouldn't be a body underneath a tree. He didn't bury a body under a tree, which is why they never found it. So do they think he planted it? No, they believe that a seed from a nearby palm tree that's the exact same type germinated right above Matthew's body and begun to sprout. Once they like researched a little bit more, this palm tree, this new life was only five years old. So it had basically just happened, happened by chance that this palm tree ended up being grown wow. here. Matthew's parents have been there for every single day of this search and they are there as the forensic investigators retrieve and exhume their son's skeletal remains piece by piece. As quoted by Yahoo News, Faye Levison says that, quote, no parent should have to see their child's remains placed in a brown paper bag. We had to watch them pack Maddie up and place him uh. in white cardboard boxes that were then walked past us and placed in the boot of a car. What oh my are the chances... That a palm tree literally grows over the body. Right. That's insane. That's insane. Wow. On May 9th, 2018, once the coroner's investigation is done, Matthew's family holds his funeral in the South and West Chapels in Australia. This is 11 years after his disappearance. And I, and I do need to say that when they did the autopsy, they could never find his cause of death. It had just been too long. So they can't determine whether he did overdose oh. or was murdered. So... Either way, though, to do this to your yes. you know, loved one, so to speak, yeah. is, is absolutely cruel. The other thing that I just, I just found was that they found his remains face up. Oh. He was actually face up in that shallow grave. Yeah, with and one of the things that um, his dad said was that, mm -hmm. how can somebody who supposedly has feelings for my son do something like, like that? Literally, as he right laid him in that shallow grave, kick the dirt on his face. Yeah. What? And like, oh leave him there. God. What an evil, what an evil person. Right. Jeez. Hundreds of mourners attend his funeral and the family asks the mourners to wear purple in honor of Matthew's favorite color. So there's just a sea of purple in the service. Matthew's family says they're focused now on honoring Matthew and they're trying not to focus on Atkins. Faye Levison tells the press that her biggest fear all along was that she would die before Matthew's body would be found. Now, after this, Atkins is still a free man. He's still a free man. He did his part of the deal. He yeah. led them to the body. So he moves away out of Sydney and north to Brisbane in the state of Queensland in Australia after he's acquitted. And just like Josh said, there becomes a flurry of people. He becomes shunned by the gay community. He's banned from nightclubs. He frequently has to move his place of residence because he starts trying to pick up younger men again. He starts trying to go wow. out to these clubs. He starts trying to do it all over again. But people 
know of him now. And so word spreads everywhere he moves. It's posted on Facebook. It's posted online. And he just can't seem to settle down. I always wonder if he did this once, has he done it before? Yeah. Oh, right? Like, well, all these people came forward saying he sexually assaulted me. Yeah. But I mean, like killing has he somebody. Killing. Yeah. yeah. You never know. It's I don't know. possible. Yeah. Well, when you're dealing with all these pretty serious drugs, yeah, I mean, there's always the possibility that potentially somebody he's fooling around with overdoses and yep or you know, overdoses or overdoses yeah. or like he overdose. yeah i mean for all we know he's he could be doing this on purpose right and like yeah, yeah. too much on purpose or right. laced with something or yeah and stuff go you know he's then taking advantage of them after they're unconscious that's what i kept thinking especially at the beginning is like yeah how much of this is consensual yeah and, especially the drug taking and everything right and, and did he introduce the ghb Right. Was this Michael Atkins all along being like, oh, let's party with this drug? Mm -hmm. well, it's easier to take advantage on someone on Once GHB. That's for sure. Yeah. The nerve of this guy yeah. after going through all of this, walking a family to the body of their son that you Ugh. killed, and then to get back out there and try to prey on more younger people. Yeah. It, it's almost impossible to put your mind into someone who who mm -hmm. can think and act that way 100 percent. there's like full-blown forms of people warning other men That's about terrifying him. that he is still out there yeah and of course there's there's got to be so many people out there that don't, don't know, know about him exactly oh, that didn't. is very scary yeah it's it's very scary wow that he can get off and then live a normal life and go prey on other people doesn't after. it creep you out when you cover cases like this and you think he could be listening. Yeah. I literally, I think. Don't I even do. try to come to my house. Time, though. Yeah. It's weird. Mm -hmm. Don't even get close to my house. No, I mean, he's evil. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Same with us. Yeah. It's scary. We're protected over here. Yeah. yeah. Simply safe. <laughs> Code has been right. Code has been. <laughs> but here is the best part about this episode. Matthew's parents save the palm tree that was dug up during the last day of that search. They wrap it up. They transport it and they lovingly plant it in their own garden oh. at their Oh my home. God. I love that. Yeah. That is so, wow. That is powerful of course, because I yeah. mean, it's like part of him grew into that tree essentially. It was new life over him. Oh my God. That's, I'm going to cry. That's amazing. So the tree that had sprouted new life, this tree, they now named Matt's Palm. And Matthew's dad, Mark Levison, tweets, quote, crime scene complete, coming home with Matt's palm and raising a glass to all those involved in bringing Matt home, XO. And along with the tweet is a photo of Mark and Faye standing in front of their son's palm tree, and there's another photo of them raising a glass. And they want you all to know that Matthew's memory lives on. And that is the case of Matthew Levison. That is powerful oh yeah it's just so unfortunate that they weren't able to get true justice for the yeah. son and for what happened to him and get to the bottom of what really happened i don't think it, i could ever cope with that anger oh. yeah i i don't know how i don't know how people do mm -hmm. because whether or not he was actually murdered which i tend to lean towards murdered and maybe not in necessarily in an extremely violent way but there's right. also you know, whenever you're giving people drugs, you know, is the drug dealer liable for giving yeah. somebody yep. a drug that they end up dying from? Yep. And so those are the questions that I'd like to know is, you know, what what was he taking? And and Michael, of course, just puts all of the responsibility on on Matthew and says, oh, it's his fault. Yep. You know, he took the drugs and he ended up dying as a result of of overdose. But it's I, just, yeah. I don't believe that. I know. There's I don't. No I don't way. believe it at all. I don't no think way. I believe it either. Hammer, what's with the duct tape? I think he for sure killed him. Yeah. Why would you not? Just, just you're not going to be in trouble if you wake up and you find, you know, your no. boyfriend accidentally overdosed, and you call yeah. paramedics, and they're able to determine. It yep, happens. Yeah, it yeah. does. It happens all the time. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. So the fact that he, you know, and his excuse, I believe, was like. I just freaked out. Yeah. I just freaked out because he was dead and I didn't know what to do. But it's like eh, all of his excuses that I heard sound like a bunch of bullshit. Yeah. yeah. Like it just sounds like yep. he's just trying to protect himself at the end of the day because he's narcissistic. He only cares about himself. He does. He never really cared about Maddie. He was just purely using him for his own pleasure and using him as a tool to get 
other men. Yep. Yeah. And he doesn't care about his life at all. He's yep. disposable to him. Right. No. He, he never once took blame. When, never once. No. And and if his story is true and he buried his boyfriend because he overdosed. So then when his parents have to learn on their own that their son is missing and they go to the, the police to report that it might be a hate crime, he decides that that's the time in his own words. That's the time to go sleep with someone else. Yeah. After you've face up buried your boyfriend. So there's yep. a lot about him. Yeah. That's like if you were to create a that's like sociopathic criminal yeah. profile, you know, the oh. FBI created a profile on this guy. I guarantee you he's capable of murder. Oh, 100%. Oh, 100%. A, a violent individual. You know, we who knows what his past looks like and, yeah. you know, what other things, what his rap sheet looks like. I mean, we don't know, but he seems very capable to me, at least, of committing murder. I mean, he's able to go through with burying a dead body in the middle of the forest. That says a lot about somebody mm -hmm. who's able to do that. Yeah. Let alone lay them down in the ground, kick dirt over them and leave and essentially forget about it and just move yeah. on with your life. It says a lot. Terrific. It's crazy. Yeah, I, I agree. I There's no way in my mind I can believe that he just overdosed on drugs. No. And I don't know, maybe. I guess there's always that possibility, but I just, I can't. I can't believe that. Even if he did, he, he even if that far-fetched story is true, he deserved a proper burial and his yeah. parents didn't deserve to go through what they went through and all the wasted resources. And Well, why wouldn't he have just called the police and told them? Yeah, yeah exactly. Even exactly. if you are freaking out, call, we hear it all the time on 911 calls, call and freak yeah. out on the 911 call. Yeah. No, he obviously didn't care. I mean, he went and slept with someone else afterwards. Like, this guy, yeah. this guy didn't care. Like, even if he's trying to argue that the hammer was bought for gardening. Yeah. Which, for zucchini. That makes no sense. The pickaxe. But the, the yeah. duct, duct tape, what what was that used for? It's a yeah. good point. I didn't think about that. So weird. I think, yeah, I think he. Lied. I think I think something went wrong after they left the club that night, and he did something to him. Yep. Or he, well, it depends on who was sending those text messages in that first hour. Yeah, because I forgot about those text messages. I think yeah. they went home. The fight worsened. Yeah, he storms out. Like the Matthew, next morning? No, no, that night. Matthew's okay. still mad. He's texting. Michael storms out. He goes back to the club. He's probably like, F you. I'm leaving. Yeah. I'm going back out to party. Yep. Because in those texts, Matthew's saying, I want to go, but he won't let me. So you That's think, what he's saying in mm -hmm. those texts. So you think it really is him sending those text messages? Yes. And okay. then I think Michael I think comes so home from the club after giving him another finger by going out and telling him he can't go. Yeah. Comes home and the fight continues and he kills him. Mm. That's yeah. what I think happens. I agree yeah. with Peyton. That's I think I'm an, I And then the, the next boat. morning at 12, he goes to Menards. No. He goes and he buys the stuff he needs to help with the burial. He rips out the speaker. He puts the body in and he goes and does it. I don't even think the drugs are a factor here. If you I think about either. it, these guys were doing drugs like all the time. Yeah. So they're very experienced, you know, drug takers and partiers. And so they knew how to how to handle that stuff. Yeah. I don't, I, I think that's just a convenient excuse for Michael to use in order to pass the blame on to something else. And maybe that's part of his whole plan. I mean, maybe that's the way that he operates is that yeah. he uses that, at, you know, cause he knows that, oh yeah, there's always a possibility yep. that you could overdose. So yeah. that's the real killer. But in, in his, his words and the reality is, is that he's the killer. Oh, and, yeah. he, and he's the one that's actually doing it and he's taking advantage of these boys and the fact there was nine boys that came forward at this inquest to say what a creepy that's a lot that I mean he's a, he sh I can't believe he's not a sexual offender I know. he should yeah. be uh, you that's know, a good point he's mm -hmm. he's clearly going around yeah preying upon young men that are 20 plus years younger than him not because he's trying to find love and, nope. and you know no. do it the right way he's doing it to try to yeah you know, he's got some sort of sick insatiable ego thirst control. and ego for for a certain type of individual that he's just purely mm -hmm. using for his own enjoyment and at the wow. the price of these poor young men and he's still out there yep and he's still crazy. out there crazy he's still out there i know so that's beware. so disturbing beware yeah. that's all i mean I it makes sense with. why they all shunned him yeah oh yeah mm -hmm. yeah god it's this is an, a super important case to bring awareness yeah. to, especially 100%. for people out in australia okay yeah come and in LGBT. contact with this yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. watch out for michael atkins yeah i just maybe yeah. changed his name now maybe. i mean i know it says knows? that he tries to live under the radar now but there's pictures i mean yeah there are there will be pictures on our instagram pictures on the youtube videos uh you you know what he looks like and beware yeah. because 
somebody Crazy. like Hitler. this isn't stopping. Yeah. No, he, I no agree. but he wasn't stopped. No. no. He was never stopped. He was no. never faced anything, any yep. consequences mm-hmm. for his behavior. So what a tragedy. Chances are he'll continue yeah. doing what he's Matthew doing. Matthew seemed so. like such a nice person. You, you know when you, you just can look at someone and they, he looked so full of life. You can look at the picture. Sweet. Yes. And everyone was like, no, he was life of the party. He was kind. He just. He he wanted to have a good time. He loved his yeah. family. That like devastating. Yeah. Yeah, I feel so bad for his parents. I mean, that's that's just so hard to lose your your little boy like that. Yes. Yeah. And then never to have, get justice. Yeah. Never I have would anything. Never done. ever get over the anger. No, I, it and would it, eat me alive. It's different for you now. You just had a baby. Yeah. I man. Yeah, don't even get me started on that. I mean, yeah. Yeah. this guy would be a dead man. I know. You know, because yeah, Josh would go find him himself. Yeah. And, and I mean, here's here's the thing too, is like Australia operates much differently than the United yep. States, right. so especially like they use very unconventional in comparisons, to United right. States to do this. Like the fact that they literally had the victim's parents working with him to yeah. find their loved yes. one and they in gave the him car. the car. You know what they also did That's too? Crazy. They were trying to figure out like if he's driving into the Royal National Park, yeah, where, how, you know, how far do we need to go off the road in order to find the body? Because obviously you're dealing with 40,000 plus acres. Yeah, they were doing like scientific. They gave him a mannequin. Yes. A 70 kilogram mannequin to to drag to see how far he could drag it off of the road. And they're watching. Oh my God. So they're literally watching him replay what he did that night. Holy crap. That is mind blowing. Yeah. I don't think I've ever heard of any case that's like this. That's done that, no. But Personally. I think I, I think about it in in some cases here in the United States. Like, would it help victims' families take a deal like that where they mm. they get their you know they find their loved one or their loved one's remains, but the killer is able to just walk free? Would they take that? Oh, I, I think so. I think so. Yeah. You hear all the time so. in these cases. I mean, it's the same freaking case over and over again of these families going. We don't even care anonymously. Yeah. We won't charge you. Just tell us where they are. Tell us what happened. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I've heard. I've heard that many times too. I'm so glad that they have the palm tree. Oh like, I mean, not That's that it's really special. It's always yeah. something when they can take tragedy and turn it into something hopeful, mm-hmm. and have a have a place almost to to like visit with him. Yeah. in a way. it was That's new really life. Cool. Yeah, yeah. That's, that feels. Oh, when I learned about that, I just cried. It's like something greater yeah made that happen yeah you know oh, for sure it's for a reason and even though it was the reason they couldn't find him mm-hmm. it's also like new life yeah but in a sense it almost was is the reason i mean they kept going so yeah wow that was an interesting case yeah maybe today we can all just take a moment and do whatever you do to honor or think about uh Matthew and his family. But yeah. we, again, were so happy to have you guys on the show. It was we're a so lot of, to be here. I hate saying there was a lot of fun. I, I know, know, right? You know, yeah, it, that it's hard now doing podcasting about something so serious, but. But it was um, entertaining and different for us to yeah. have someone else who yeah. gets what we do. Who and, gets true crime and doesn't get it at all. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. But it seems to be yeah. getting it more and <laughs> more. Getting so. there. Yeah. <laughs> no, yeah. And You're I getting think it. it's just cool to be around other people who look at these cases the same way yeah. we do mm-hmm. and want to sit here and talk about Matthew mm-hmm. and want to honor him and talk about the case and talk about the justice. And like, I think that that we're doing, all of us listening right now are doing more than we think we are. I yeah. would definitely say so. Yeah. All right. Well, that was our episode for today. We hope you guys love it. Thank you, Kendall and Josh, for being here. And you will definitely be seeing them again. Let us know in the comments uh, what you thought about this case. And if you want to see more collapse between Mile Higher and Murder With My Husband. And we will see you next time. I love it. I hate it. Goodbye. <laughs>